Welcome everybody, whether you're here this morning with us physically or whether you're watching us on, uh, on YouTube, you're all very welcome and we pray that God will bless you and all those who listen to his word today. We're going to pray. Please join me as we pray. Father God, uh, we, we thank you this morning that you've given us the privilege of being able to worship you. Lord, we uh, might be worshipping here physically together, or Lord, perhaps we are watching this on a video. But Lord, we thank you that uh, you've given us this privilege, this privilege of hearing your word, this privilege of being able to understand your word. Lord, this morning we want to pray for your world, this world, Lord, that is going through so much turmoil. Lord, there is, uh, of course, the ongoing problem of uh, coronavirus, and we pray, Lord, for all those areas that are badly affected, those countries, Lord, especially those that don't have the same kind of um, medical uh, treatment that we are able to give here. Lord, we pray for those who are searching for vaccines, those, Lord, who need wisdom in to know how to deal with this. And we pray for each one of us, Lord, because this really comes into loving our neighbours, Lord, that we might be careful in what we do, that in everything that we do, we might think of others. Lord, we pray that you will be with us as we deal, or deal with as best as we can, this crisis. Lord, there are so many things happening across the world with elections forthcoming, with uh, problems, with uh, race uh, issues. Lord, there are so many things. Lord, you made this world and you said that it was very good. And yet, Lord, it has been spoilt. But we pray, Lord, that this world will be a place which once again honours you. Lord, we thank you that even through the turmoil of coronavirus, even though we've not been able to do lots of things that we would love to have done, Lord, we thank you that you have been with us, <clears throat> that you have been faithful, that you are unchanging. And uh, Lord, we pray that we will hold on to that. Lord, the Apostle Paul that sa said that there is nothing, nothing that can separate us from your love. And Lord, help us to remember that that includes coronavirus. Be with us this morning, Lord, as we worship you, as we listen to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things that people have enjoyed while we've been doing uh, our online services is when we've interviewed somebody who maybe has had some connection with the church. And so we thought we'd do one of those this week. And you have probably heard us, well, you will have heard us talk about NAYC, National Association, Northamptonshire Association of Youth Clubs. And you might have heard us talk about James Yates, who is the church worker and is the one who is connected to our church. So I thought I'd have a bit of a chat with James this week uh, so that you can just see who he is and we could find out what, how, how COVID had affected NAYC. So this is James Yates. Well, morning, James. Thanks ever so much for joining with us uh, morning. this morning. Um, we just wanted to find out a little bit more about you and your work. We've often talked about you in church. People have heard your name and obviously NAYC. People know a lot about that because we've been affiliated for uh, well over 50 years, I think. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, where you live, that kind of thing. Well, I'm James. I live in Daventry, down in the uh, south of the county. And um, I live with my wife, Sarah, and my two uh, girls, Esther and Iona, who are five and one and a half. And um, I worship at the Vineyard Community Church, where I'm also the youth pastor and the worship leader as well. OK. Um, how long have you lived in Daventry? I've lived in Daventry um, for 13, 13 years. Okay, so just, a little, just a little bit less than we've been in Rushton then. So you work for NAYC, that's Northampton Association of Youth Clubs, for those who don't know. Um, can you tell us a bit about your role? Has it changed? Have you always done the same thing? My um, 
so I've been working for NYC for six, seven years now. Um, NYC is a Christian charity um, that seeks to support youth work across the county. Um, so that's all types of youth work. My role specifically is to support churches, um, support them and so they can grow their youth ministry and that's youth and children's as well. Um, I've had a few roles with NAYC. So I first actually came in contact with the High Street um, at, when I was the East North Ants, um youth worker. And so I did that for a few um, a few months, then moved over to Daventry where I live. Uh, I've now been supporting um, the churches uh, countywide for um, the last four or five years. Okay, so you're specifically uh, working to, to support the churches? Yes. So, so I, do NAYC I, only work with churches? No, we work with everyone, anyone working with young people. So uh, we work in schools, we work, um, we're primarily youth clubs, but the youth club definition is a very vague one. So we work with uniform groups, scouts, guides. Um, we work with um, groups supporting young people with additional needs, uh, the disabled groups, things like that. So we, it's quite a wide breadth of groups that we work with. Okay. But the Christian ethos is very much throughout the whole organisation, isn't it? Very much so. Um, we've even got a, a conference centre and a sports centre in Northampton, but all the staff are Christian and the Christian, our faith underpins everything that we do. We seek to serve, well, we serve God and serve the community. Okay. And does that ever cause any difficulties with other groups that aren't Christian groups? Um, I think people know who we are and what we do and um, as with my role it's particularly easy because I work in churches but um, part of our reason when we're working with the groups we're there to support and serve so sometimes we can't be as explicit about our faith um, as we can be uh, as I can be working in churches but it's it's sort of that um, that ethos still underpins everything that we do. Okay, and everybody knows it's a Christian organisation. Oh, yes. Yeah, and you also not just work with the youth clubs. You do things like training, don't you? And we do. We, I say, we support um, youth work. So a lot of our work is with leaders as well. So we we train um, youth leaders because um, most people running. Um, running groups for young people are volunteers. They, mm -hmm. this army of people across the county that are supporting and helping young people and running these groups. Most of them do it in their spare time. So part of my role is to uh, give them the skills, the tools to be able to do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's brilliant. Um, now we've obviously been through lockdown. What changes did that do to NAYC? Did you have to close, stop working or? Yeah, um, well, I say most of our role is sort of face to face with people. So when you know, um, the social gathering is kind of our, our line of work. So um, for the first few months we were um, all on furlough and there's not a lot we could have done. Um, as things have started to ease, we're now uh, working a lot online we're working with um, youth group leaders to kind of work out how you can run a youth club with all mm -hmm. the restrictions and the guidance which keep changing right but um so it's slowly getting there but it's been a long time it's been a sort of difficult six months yeah that's I'd right say. we've we've arranged to meet up next week haven't we to see what we can do because we want to restart our youth work uh, whether it's face to face or whether it needs to be online. Well, Definitely. NAYC, we've always been really well connected with NAYC. We've done loads of things there. We've been to the conference centre. We've played five a side football there. We've uh, been to the trampoline centre. And you've come and done lots of things with us. Richard, um, our kids love Richard uh, when he comes and does his craft evenings. 
is there something then, James, that we can pray for, particularly for you uh, as you we go into this more opening up things? I think it's, there are sort of, I mean, I'm going to be greedy and grass for three things. First of all, it's the, um, the wisdom and the discernment, knowing what to do, when to do it, and how to best help groups, because each one, each individual group is different. So there'll be some groups that can open, you know, we can put restrictions, we can put things in to get them open. There are some groups that it won't be appropriate, so we need to work how we can get groups going online. So it's working, it's that sort of wisdom, really. Mm -hmm. Second is to pray for um, my colleagues and the youth leaders across the county. And thirdly, it's for the young people. I have the privilege of working with thousands of young people across the county. And it's not a good, it's a difficult time to be a young person at the minute. It was so much up in the air. Um, so just to pray for um, young people across Northamptonshire. Okay, well, we'll do that. We'll do that in our service this morning. And uh, it's been great to speak to you, James. I'm looking forward to meeting up next week and we can uh, work through where we can go uh, and what we can do. So thanks for your time. And we will continue to pray for you and all the work at NAYC. Thank you very much. Okay, so we thought it'd be good to put uh, a face to, um, to James because we've talked about him a lot. And uh, that's the kind of work that they're doing. So I'm sure that Dick will uh, include that in the prayers uh, afterwards. We're going to use the screen again. Um, glad we've got it. Because we're going to listen to a song. And this is one of the songs that the group did for us. This is the song, Come, Let Us Worship the King of Kings.
This morning's Bible reading is Philippians chapter 3 and reading from verse 1 down to verse 7. Philippians 3 verses 1 to 7. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. We're going to look at that this morning, and uh, I, I pray that the Lord will bless us as we do that. On Friday, I had a, quite a mixed morning. I, was, uh, I, I went to Asda shopping, and we used the scan and go thing. Uh, where you scan your own and then just pay and go out. You don't have to go through the tills because you find it a lot quicker. So I got to the, I, I did everything. I got to the pay and the screen said processing, processing, processing and wouldn't go any further. And so the guy came over and he said, it's not working. The system's gone down. He says, so you're going to have to go through the till. I thought, oh no. Oh, that's what I want to try and save having to do, because uh, I was a bit in a bit of a rush. He said, but don't worry, I'll give you some vouchers as a goodwill thing. And he gave me five pounds off my shopping. And I thought, oh, that's pretty good, actually. So I got home thinking, yes, five pounds off my shopping. Um, that's really good. And when I got home, the postman had been. And there was a letter through the door, the Reverend Philip John Hearson. And I thought, oh, that's going to be something serious. And so I opened it. And it's from CP Plus, a parking charge notice of £100. Because it's for when we went on holiday, and it's from the um, motorway services at Doncaster. And we stayed in the travel lodge. Now, don't worry, I'm, I've appealed it. Because wh when we went in, we, we gave our number, and she put it in the, in the computer. And I'm sure she put in staying for two days. Um, but then we went out from the travel lodge out to somewhere to eat. So when we came back in, the cameras picked us up as a second visit. And so uh, I didn't know you got to put it in the computer again. And so they've got us here in capture, out capture, picture of us 2036 to 0953. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to appeal it because I think I've got good grounds for not paying. I think I've got good grounds. Because it said, send any evidence that you've got why you ought not to pay it. I will come back onto that right towards the end. I'll let you know how it goes on. Actually, if I pay it early, it's only £60. So we'll see. Philippians chapter 3 starts off like this. Finally, my brothers... Finally, but I thought, but we're only halfway through the book. Finally, that I, I heard the story about a preacher stood there and he said, finally, and there's a little boy in the congregation who said to his dad, what does he mean by finally? He said, nothing at all. <laughs> it was probably here just a kind of a linking word, but it goes into a passage which is loaded with sermon material. Uh, down to verse, verse 11 or even on, there is so much that you could preach on. So many different short texts. And I felt it right that we ought to cover the whole passage from verses 1 down to verse 11. But then I started preparing it and I thought this is not going to do this justice. And I felt God say, no, only go to verse 7. Don't try and do it all in one go. So it might be quite short. 
But that might be like that word, finally, from a preacher. Finally, says Paul, rejoice in the Lord. And that just brings this question to mind, doesn't it? What do you rejoice in? What is it that you rejoice in? What do I rejoice in? Well, Paul is going to bring out where our real joy can be. But he starts with a warning. He starts with this warning. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. Doesn't mince his words, does he? You see, dogs, that was a derogatory term. But it was a term that the Jews used for the Gentiles. They regarded them as dogs, but Paul turns it on them. And he uses these three different terms. But, but I'm sure that he's meaning the same people. The dogs, those who do evil, the mutilators. Those who do evil are the false teachers within the church. The, the ones who he calls the mutilators are those who say that to be accepted by God, the Christians needed to keep the law and in particularly to be circumcised. Now, in Genesis 17, there was the instruction to Abraham that boys must be circumcised at the age of eight. And it was a sign of a covenant between God and his people. But Paul says now that under the new covenant in Christ, it is believers who are the circumcision. Those who were circumcised were those who were recipients of the promises of God. And uh, he says that believers can be seen in three ways. It's not about whether you're keeping the law at all. He says, first of all, those who worship by the Spirit of God. Those who are God's people. Those who are indwelt by the Spirit. This is the only way that we can truly worship. From hearts that have been circumcised inwardly, where the old life of sin has been cut away. And then he says, those who glory in Christ Jesus. Those who, some versions say, boast in him. And we shall see how that is referring to our trust in him rather than what we do. But you know, we glory in or we boast about what we are most proud of, don't we? To boast means this, to talk with excessive pride and self-satisfaction about one's achievements, possessions or abilities. Now I'm sure that we've all boasted in some way, haven't we, to some different degrees. I'm sure that we've all been, been proud about things, been proud about our children or their achievements, been proud about all kinds of things. But here, it's not about our own achievements. It's not about our possessions or our abilities. Paul says to glory in Christ Jesus. His achievements, what he has done, primarily, of course, his work on the cross to bring us salvation. And then Paul says, those who do not put confidence in the flesh, and the flesh here is our human achievements, our old nature. See, this is what those people that Paul was writing about um, did. They are called the Judaizers. That's what they were known as in the churches. And, and they believed and taught that to be acceptable to God, believers had to follow all the Old Testament laws, especially circumcision. And they even saw it as a requirement to receive salvation. So these were kind of a group who thought it was Jesus plus. Jesus plus. You've got, they didn't deny that Jesus um, was the one who had come. They didn't deny the work of Jesus, but it was Jesus plus. But for Paul, it was Jesus only. The plus wasn't needed. 
Now, we've got this term plus, haven't we now? We've got one metre plus. You know what that means, don't you? It means um, if you can't be two metres away, be at least one metre away plus other things. You've got to add other things to it as well. But Paul says, no, you don't need that plus. It's not Jesus plus, it's Jesus. Now, they might say, well, Paul is only preaching that because he's got nothing of himself to glory in. He's got nothing in himself to boast about. He hasn't got a plus like we have, so that's why he's not talking about it. But Paul says this, if you think you've got anything to put confidence in, I've got more. If you think that, I've got more. Let's see what Paul said. First of all, he said he was circumcised on the eighth day. The letter of the law had been observed. So in other words, he didn't just join the Jews, but from a baby, the letter of the law had been observed. Then he said he was of the people of Israel. In other words, he was born and bred. He was part of the people of God. Then he said he was of the tribe of Benjamin. You see, Jews wanted to be able to trace their ancestry back to their tribe. And Benjamin had the smallest territory of all the tribes, but was very significant in Israelite history. For one thing, the first king was from the tribe of Benjamin. And, and I'd not, I have to say, I don't think I'd even realise this, I'd not put this connection, but Paul was Saul. So he got the same name as the first king, who came from the tribe of Benjamin. You see, if they said, so, come on then, what tribe are you from? I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. He knew that. He said he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Jew, but probably meaning a child of godly parents. Hebrew son of Hebrew parents. You see, these are all natural things, and he'd got all of them. He'd got all of them. Paul couldn't do anything about them. He couldn't uh, have changed that because he was circumcised. He was of those people. He was born of that tribe. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. They were all things that he couldn't have anything to do with. But there are three more things that he says. First of all, he says he was a Pharisee. Now, the Pharisees were the strictest keepers of the law. They, they, they kept it to the tiniest detail. In Acts chapter 23, where Paul was speaking there, he said, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. You see, it was in his blood. It was part of his DNA, if you like. He had been totally devoted to the law in every detail. There were over 600 laws and they kept them down to the very, very, uh, to the detail as far as they possibly could. And then he said he was zealous, so zealous that he was persecuting the church. MacArthur said that views, Jews viewed zeal as the supreme religious virtue, to be zealous he said they saw it as a two-sided coin. I like this. One side of it was love, but the other side of the coin was hate. And so to be zealous was to show the love side to God and to hate what offended him. That was to be zealous. Now, how had Paul shown that then? Well, first of all, he was zealous, of course, in his love for God. Of course he was. But he showed the other side of it by persecuting Christians. We can find this in um, Acts 8 and verse 3, and then into um, chapter, chapter 9. Acts 8 verse 3, we, re we read these words. Saul began to destroy the, ha the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Then into chapter 9, Paul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. See, he was so zealous 
that he loved God, but he hated anything that he thought was against God, including the church. And then he said, as for legalistic righteousness, he was faultless. See, outwardly, he obeyed all the rules. He was righteous in his own eyes. Righteousness being, means being right with God. And the goal of this, the Pharisee was self-righteousness. It was a righteousness of works, but it could never be attained. It could never be attained. So, am I saying that being right with God can never be attained? Well, if you're relying only on yourself, on doing all the right things, the things of the flesh, the old way of life, no, it can't. It can't. Just think about Paul. I used to be um, an accountant, it's a long time now, it's nearly 30 years ago. And one of the things I used to do was profit and loss accounts. And we had to add up all the profit. And what we did at the end of the year, you added the profit to what had been made in previous years. So you've got this kind of this, this big pot, if you like, of profit. If you made a loss one year, it came out of that. But hopefully you made profit every year. And this was building up. And there was a day when all those things that Paul had got there, he saw as the profit. Profit is things that is, is something to your benefit or to your advantage. And for Paul, there was a huge amount of things there that he saw as profit. But then in verse 7, he says that everything was, that was to his benefit, his advantage, he now sees as loss everything. Everything, whatever was to my profit, whatever was to my profit. I was uh, talking to Michael in the, in the week, and uh, when he preached, uh, I'm going to quote two things that he said, he already knows this, so um, I don't need to worry. He, 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 he pointed out when Paul, in Romans chapter 8, he, he talked about, um, when, he, when, he was, when he was talking about nothing can separate us from God he said nothing and anything else that meant there was nothing at all everything he listed but if he missed something that was included as well so that couldn't uh, be, be me that couldn't be uh, anything that could separate you from God's love and now Paul says the same whatever was to my profit so there are those things that he's listed then and then, he, then anything else that I've relied on as well, whatever was to my profit. You see, Paul was putting his confidence in the wrong place. It was a false basis of confidence. It was in the flesh. So where is Paul's confidence? Well, we're going to look at it in more detail next week in the second part. But let's just have a look um, at the first part of that. Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing G Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. His confidence is in knowing Jesus Christ. You see, he relied on all those things, but then he met with Jesus on the Damascus Road. You probably know the story, it's in Acts and chapter 9. After, after trying to destroy the church, Paul saw, or Saul at the time, saw a blinding light and literally he was unable to see. He was made blind. But this is one of those things that God does, one of the great things that God does, I think. You see, in the eyes of the world, Saul's eyes were closed. He was blinded. But the truth is, actually, that his spiritual eyes were opened to see Christ for all his glory and for who he was, the risen, victorious Lord. He'd done everything to be accepted by God on the basis of self-righteousness. But now he has seen how the only way to be accepted is by grace, the righteousness that comes from God. 
And this is the second thing I want to just quote from Michael because he talks about grace and Chuck Swindle's definition. And if you weren't uh, here at the time, um, this is what he said. God's unmerited favour that I haven't earned, that I don't deserve, that I can never repay. So God's got his hand on this. When Michael preached, it fits in this. When Dick preached, it fits in with this about seeing by faith. We, we, we come by faith, not by sight. See, Paul came by faith, not by sight on what he'd done in the past. Michael spoke about grace, which is, just fits in perfectly here. You see, that definition there, there was a time that Paul could not write about grace. He wouldn't be able to write about grace. He couldn't understand grace because he would have thought that he had earned God's favour. He deserved it for all that he was doing. And he'd repaid it by being faithful to the law. But now everything he considers a loss compared to knowing Jesus the subject for this morning was, where's your confidence? Where's your confidence? And this is where we come back to the letter. My confidence is in them doing the right thing. The right thing. To say, we've decided there's no charge to answer. It's all about them. I can't do anything now. It's up to them. It's up to them. Our background won't be like Paul's background. But you might say, well, it was. You know, I was christened as a child. I've always been in church since I was really young. I can remember back to those days when um, and people talk about it and, um, you know, when you were in Sunday school and all those kind of things and the bazaars and Margaret O'Dell used to tell me about the, the times when you had meals and you used to queue down the stairs for your tea. Can you, some of you can remember those days. You might say my parents, both Christians. I've tried my hardest to live by the rules, to keep the commandments, to be kind to my neighbours, never misreading my Bible. All these, Paul said, and anything else, are good things. But we must, like Paul, have come to that place where we see these things are loss compared to knowing Christ as Lord and Saviour. Where's your confidence? What are you trusting in? Is it, is it your own things, what you've done? Is it Jesus plus, plus something else? Paul said, I consider everything lost compared with knowing Christ. The greatest thing in all my life, said the songwriter, is knowing you. Where's your confidence? Next week, we're going to look more at what Paul wrote about Jesus Let's pray. Father, we thank you for those words of the Apostle Paul. And Lord, we see the great change that there was in his life. The time when he was relying on self and obedience to the law. But when he met Jesus, his eyes were opened. And he said, I now consider everything loss compared to the greatness of knowing Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that each one of us might know deep within our hearts that our whole trust is in him, that our salvation is only of him. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today from your word. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be with us this both this day and forevermore. Amen.